So I was I was watching uh, I was watching the Daily Show so yesterday. So I says to Mabel, I says I says, and, uh, yeah, I'll this story later. <laughs> and I liked how you guys had Tom Brokaw on. Oh wait, he's here right now. It's me, Tom Brokaw. It's, it's not <laughs> bad. It's not no, a it's bad. Not it's not as but <laughs> greatest to, generation compared to the other. <laughs> More like the fleecing of America. It's me. Tom Brokaw. The greatest generation. No, that's <laughs> more of a Took me forever to get Jimmy here. Stewart, I yeah. had to walk. This is Jimmy Stewart. It's higher pitch. Well, it's good to meet you. I'm Tom Brokaw. Oh, I had to walk oh, the whole God. way. I don't like take the subway train. Deeper Jimmy Stewart with a little bit more yeah, Sean Connery. It's me, Tom Brokaw. It's Tom Brokaw. Welcome to if God NBC wanted me to tra- I'm really new. <laughs> if God wanted me to travel in tunnels in the ground... He would have made me shy halud. <laughs> it's just like that scene in the trip. <laughs> <laughs> just like By the every way, scene I, in the trip. I just read Dune. It's great. <laughs> I consider myself kind of a modern jib <laughs> of NBC News. Uh, the greatest generation. Uh, and you do a good Tom Brokaw. Oh, thanks. Hey, thanks. I'll add that to thanks. my... Thanks. I was talking to Dan. You, you have two voices you do now. What if Tom Brokaw was on a date with Michael Caine? <laughs> I think it would end in disappointment. <laughs> oh, all right. Because they're both straight gentlemen. Well, I was thinking because uh, Michael Caine would, would not be able to last very long. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm used to a longer-lasting lover. <laughs> I'm afraid that you were just too erotic for me. (laughs) I'm sorry, Tom. I spilled my seed almost immediately. (laughs) The shawl in my hair. (laughs) Do you have have some kind of comb to get it out of my hair? Now, please leave. (laughs) Maybe, maybe, Maybe peanut butter. This is not. This is not. This is not a serious relationship, Tom. This is a one-night stand. Would you just take your things and go? But I didn't even get a nut. <laughs> I'm, the ad said no names, except we're both quite famous. So it was very hard to avoid us knowing each other's names. You see, the spice comes from the rats. That's the secret. Oh, you gotta milk them. Yeah, you milk them. Spice teats. <laughs> uh. But so the idea Tom that- Brokaw was telling me about it. <laughs> <laughs> what? what did that sound like? Uh, so I was reading Dune the other day. <laughs> the shy eludes are like rats. I had our vision of a uh, massive jihad sweeping the universe, please, killing billions. Please stop telling me about Shou- Dune. Shouting the name I'm Tom so Brokaw. I'm very bored by you recapping the plot of Dune over and over Michael, again. Michael, I, th- I, w- I thank you for agreeing to this second liaison. <laughs> if I wanted to read Dune, I could just read Dune, or I could watch the David Lynch film. I know. No, it's I not wouldn't the same do that. Thing. It's not a great representation. I'm a busy of, man. of the story. <laughs> If anything, watch Yodorovsky's Dune, which again is not accurate, but more interesting. I get, it's something about spice. I don't care. <laughs> now, but it's interesting. You see, I am turning into Jimmy Stewart over time. <laughs> Will you two keep it down up there? I'm the ghost of Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> that was I'm a... trying to finish reading Chapter House Dune. <laughs> that, was... that sounded more like Don Knotts than Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> that was a little. That was a little playlet we like to call an unlikely conversation between Tom Brokaw, Michael Caine, and Jimmy Stewart. About Dune. <laughs> Thank well, you. Jack Nicholson's here. <laughs> oh, no. Who wants to talk about Dune Messiah? <laughs> <laughs> now, is here, Jack? I can't remember if that's before or after the one that I'm reading. Well, hello, everyone. It's me, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you talking about Dune. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about Dune. <laughs> Talk about an evil empire. <laughs> I, I saw like I saw Stuart make a face like he was about to jump in with another <laughs> hack impression, but he couldn't think of one in time. <laughs> the thing is, I could do a good impression, but you know, it, w- it wouldn't be the same. Mm-hmm. That's the thing; your impressions are too brilliant. <laughs> They're too good. Exactly. They're too good. Like uh, we don't know what would it sound like if Clive <laughs> Owen jumped in talking about Dune. Hello, hello. I love Dune, the book. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> He knows really, himself, of course. Yeah, really, the Peter Sellers of the flop house. <laughs> Just amazing. It's me, Paul Giamatti. I, I was walking by and I heard you talking about Dune. They're going to feel it all the way in New York, San Andreas. 
<laughs> In theaters now. <laughs> Very angry about it for some reason. Marty! <laughs> you kids, they're gonna read Dune! Oh, Mr. Lloyd. God damn, you're the worst <laughs> impressions. Well, 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 I see, got see, a giant see, rabbit as a friend. That's crazy. You can't even see him. him. That's crazy. Uh, I'm Tom Brokaw. Oh, wow. The only wow. thing stranger than this file is a little book called Dune. <laughs> <laughs> it's the story of intergalactic political. Shenanigans. We'll fight for a the good most summary. powerful resource in the galaxy. <laughs> the shenanigans, I think, is overlooked usually when people talk about Dune. But Paul Atreides, he, yeah, son right. of Duke Leto, <laughs> yeah. finds himself on Dune one cocaine ride later, and he's making meatballs, hallucinating <laughs> helicopters, and living out in the Arrakis suburbs mm -hmm. in the Freeman Witness Protection <laughs> Program. So. It's called, I call it Dune Fellas. Yep. And I hope that you're interested in producing. So, Nicolas Cage. I'll direct and star. <laughs> wow. It's called Tom Brokaw's Mary Shelley's Frank Herbert's Dune Fellas. Mm -hmm. What's your deal, Lorraine Bracco? Brackow? <laughs> Bracco? It's me, Lorraine Brokaw. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was filming The Sopranos, uh, I found that <coughs> we were at glamorizing monsters, even though that's what it seemed like we were at times. <laughs> we were showing the darker side of things Americans take for granted. Something people don't take for granted enough. Dune by Frank Herbert, <laughs> perhaps the greatest science fiction epic ever written. The story of young Paul Atreides as he attempts to become the Kosatz Hadrach on the oh, wow. spice planet of Arrakis is truly one for the ages. This is Tom Brokaw signing off. <laughs> bum, 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 I'm bum. loving it. It was weird that <laughs> it was weird that for like the decades that he uh, did that show, he signed every show off with a description of the the book Dune. Yeah, mm -hmm. he loved it. It was strange. Yeah, right. It was a that's the news for today. And remember, mm. fear is the mind killer. <laughs> I'm yeah. Tom Brokaw, and then you just leave. Every and episode. remember, my w name has become a killing word. <laughs> <laughs> I occasionally, while I'm reporting stories, have images of a jihad sweeping the universe, my own name being screamed as a battle cry, my banners <laughs> flying through unspeakable carnage. <laughs> Here is a little death within us all. I'm Tom Brokaw. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dan McCoy. I'm Stuart Wellington. And I'm Tom Brokaw, American newsman and author of The Greatest Generation. Yeah, Some would say the definitive story okay. of the baby boomers. <laughs> yeah, we've got a, I mean, a, probably our biggest get as a guest. Tom Brokaw is here now. I mean, Al, Al, yeah, Dan, uh, you're reading his credits, right? You're going you're gonna to give all his credits yeah, to everybody. Credits Dan, are... Dan uh, I can tell you're a big brokehead. Uh, name for me, what network did I anchor the lead evening news desk for 22 years? At? Uh, that would be NBC, Tom. Oh, oh, wow. I, to be honest, I did not expect you to get it correct, and yeah. <laughs> I felt a little silly for asking. <laughs> well, okay. Well, Tom's here, of course, stepping in for Elliot. I got a, I got a text right before the show. He was saying something about a butt rash, having like just like a terrible, contagious butt rash. Uh -huh. so. And that's weird for Elliot because normally he doesn't text. He really only likes to call when he's calling <laughs> us about butt rashes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've also received many calls in the night from Elliot for that oh, wow. particular malady. But it's I'm, weird. It's weird. You'd think you'd just go to bed instead of stay up all night with a butt rash. But I guess when you got a butt rash, you're like, fuck it up. I'm just going to make an all nighter. Out some, of sometimes, eight. sometimes it's a matter of not being able to sleep. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I didn't think about that. So uh, yeah, I mean, Tom just kind of swooped in. It was like it was weird. We we didn't even really ask him to come he just heard i don't know how that elliot was not going to be here and he just jumped in well let's just say as america's favorite newsman for 22 years running mm -hmm. i have my yeah. ways of getting news now oh. i also <laughs> wanted to take oh, this okay. opportunity because i do have something specific i wanted to talk about on the program uh -huh, if i yeah. if i may i'd like to uh, introduce the topic in my own inimitable way sure. if i could uh-huh Okay. Well, 
with your kind permission, I'll begin. <clears throat> He's like a vampire. A little... You gotta invite him in, Dan. <laughs> with... okay. I'll begin with a little excerpt. <clears throat> A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. This every sister of the Bene Gesserit knows. To begin your study of the life of Mardib, then, take care that you first place him in his time. Born in the 57th year of the Padishah Emperor, Shaddam IV, and take the most special care that you locate Mardib in his place, the planet Arrakis. Do not be deceived by the fact that he was born on Caledon and lived his first 15 years there. Arrakis, the planet known as Dune, is forever his place. And that's from the Manual of Maud Dib by the Princess Rulon. Oh, I see why Tom showed up, Dan. Uh, the, uh, Tom's a big Dune head, right? You could say that uh, that particular novel by Frank Herbert has been a little bit of a life manual for me, as anyone who watched me for years on NBC Nightly News would know for a fact. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm here because, as you guys know already, the, tr- the trailer for the new Dune film was just released, and I have a few thoughts about it. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I, guess, I guess you might as well enlighten us. Should I pull up the trailer myself, or... Will you just paint enough of a picture that I don't need it in front of me? It really depends more on the power of your imagination. <laughs> the trailer begins, as all great dunes do, with the Warner Brothers logo and the legendary <laughs> films logo looking yeah. very shiny, not at all what you'd expect on the dusty, gritty surface of the planet Arrakis. Uh-huh. Next, we get to our hero. Paul Atreides, played here by Timothy Chalamet. Now, he's uh, saying. Sp- I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, well, I'm not even going to address the problems you had with uh, pronouncing his last name, but I believe it is Timothy, not Timothy. Wait, really? To, to yeah. me, he. I, to Get me, he's merely out. a vessel for bringing us the story of Paul Atreides. I don't really care <laughs> how his name is pronounced. So, Timothy Chalamet, <laughs> it right. will continue to be. So, Paul Atreides, as you know, the heir to the House Atreides, one of the major mercenary and mercantile houses of the Galactic Uh, Empire, he says something is going on with his mind that he can't control. We hear this as he kisses Chani, played by Zendaya, who you may know as Michi, who (laughs) we know is one of the women. I I know Zendaya is Michi, but I, I didn't know that you would know her is Michi. That seems, uh, you know, out of your purview a little bit. Uh, I took my grandchildren to see that movie, and frankly, I only know Zendaya as Michi. I don't okay. know what else she is. For a while, I thought Michi was the actress and Zendaya was the character. And so, <laughs> I think only seeing I feel her like now that's as... That's what the director said about her performance, too. <laughs> Uh, we see her. She is, of course, the daughter of the Imperial Planetologist assigned to Dune, late mm-hmm. Keynes, uh, who I do not believe appears in the trailer. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. we see Paul waking up, and he says, there's a crusade coming. He and, or rather, two silhouetted figures that I assume can only be Paul and Chani or Paul and Lady Jessica, his mother, <laughs> look at fire and fighting on the desert plain. And now is when we get past the preamble and into the real meat of the story of Paul uh, Atreides yeah. as now he would, meets with... Yes? Would you say that this uh, trailer uh, is good at sort of introducing the story of Dune to those who may not already be familiar with it, or is it just sort of a series of, of images more so than a uh, plot-heavy trailer? Because you be say honest, we're getting into the story of Paul of 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 Dune that we all know, and uh, I've yeah. I've read Dune once, and I saw the the David Lynch movie as a very young man, and I still uh, uh, couldn't tell you much about the story of Dune. Well, like many movie trailers, it starts out with a kind of foreboding, ominous thing. Mm-hmm. Then you get a little bit of the characters, and then you get a you think the trailer's over, and then there's one last kind of special effects heavy yeah. moment, and yeah. then the title. I don't really believe uh-huh. that you can summarize all of the majesty of Dune in a three minute, fifty seven or so shot story like this now. Uh-huh. But to be honest, I've spent so many years of my life now living in Arrakis, in my headspace, yeah. that I wouldn't be yeah. able to tell you how a Dune newbie 
would take this kind of trailer. And no, so, Tom, if, Tom, Tom, would you say that living it'd in be like a like a Fremen trying to teach uh, like a newborn baby how to survive on the dusty plains of Dune, the planet Arrakis? Well, you you mentioned Fremen. It, 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 at a certain point, you forget that you're in the still suit, if you understand what I mean, uh, and yeah, it just I do becomes. Understand like unto a second layer of skin. And that's uh-huh. what Dune is to me at this point in my <laughs> well, life. Daniel, that, did that, you have a question about Dune or about <laughs> my many years in uh, na- national broadcasting? Well, I mean, they're kind of, they're kind of tied together, actually, Tom. I was going to ask, you said that you uh, spent so many years living in Arrakis in your mind. Uh, was that as a way of coping with the horrors that you had to report nightly on the nightly news? No, it was merely because Frank Herbert has spun such an enthralling tale in such Mm -hmm. a fully realized world that from the first moments, from the first time that I read Dune, honestly, having picked it up somewhat randomly in an airport bookstore, intrigued by the cover showing a desert-type landscape, and I thought to myself, I would be so thirsty if I was walking along that. I wonder what happens there, and just being Uh enthralled. I, to be honest, it was. It had not, If anything, the national news is what saved me from losing myself in yeah. Dune. Yeah. Now, if I can uh, continue, it was only by uh, telling America my supreme honor of telling America for thirty minutes what was important enough for me to talk about that. I was able to anchor myself in this reality and not yeah. lose myself the way a spice addict would to yeah. the uh, innumerable visions uh-huh. of an ever unfolding galaxy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the news was sort of your inception sort of top that yeah. uh, allowed you to re enter the real world. Uh, I think that much like the movie Inception, that is a thin metaphor overlaying <laughs> not much. <laughs> but I suppose, yes, you could say that. Now, here's where we get to the real meat of the story. As Paul meets with the Bene Gesserit mother, Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Moyham, played here by a Charlotte Rowling, and uh, she is, of course, asking him questions about the visions he receives. This is interrupted by the name of the director, a Frenchman, a Denise Villeneuve, who uh-huh. is, of course, the director of movies like Arrival and Sicario. So, you know, you know, you know uh, Tom, it's interesting to say that I think that you probably pronounce that director's last name as well as uh, Elliot might if he were Mm -hmm. here Mm -hmm. we can only imagine since he as mentioned before is dealing with a medical malady (laughs) of a particularly sensitive nature we see a storm over Arrakis. Uh, this shot is, seems to be more a uh, filler, to be honest, and perhaps uh-huh. a, yeah. an example of special effects, but they're just building suspense yeah, for building one, of, yeah. one of the key iconic moments in the Dune story, when uh-huh. Paul, of course, takes the test of the Gom Javar and yeah. has to see if his human awareness can overcome his animal instinct to uh-huh. pull his hand from a box a full yeah. of pain. If he withstands mm-hmm. the pain, then he understands that death is worse than pain and that all fear can be overcome. But if his animal instincts overcome his rationality and his human awareness, then of course he cannot take part in his fainted role in the Bene Gesserit breeding plan to bring about the enlightenment of humanity in the role of the Quisatatarach, who has access to the visions of the Golden Path. Not much of that is explained in the trailer, but you do find out that he sticks his hand in a very painful box. Hey Dan, do you think do you think I would succeed in the test of the Gom Jabbar? Uh oh boy. Yeah, I think you are the most likely to su- well I think I'm the least likely to see this. Yeah, you get smoked, dude. Let's say that. I have to, Dan, just as a listener of the podcast, I assume you would tap out before actually taking the test. They would (laughs) explain to you that a poison-tipped needle would be held to your neck while your hand was put in a box, and that alone would be enough for you to say, you know what, I'm tired, and I don't need to have any of this in my life. And you'd you'd probably go and watch... uh, an 80s horror or bikini movie that you'd already seen a few times. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's, that all that's seems totally accurate. accurate. Yeah. I didn't, I, I was, is that a, an option? Can you just say, uh, yeah. you know what? No, thanks. Was that because like, it seems like that would be a pretty good one. It would end the book pretty quickly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> do you think? Do you think? Uh, do you think bikinis exist in the world of Dune? Because everybody seems to just wear like black leather. 
I think in the universe of Dune, perhaps, but on the world of Arrakis, very unlikely. To expose so much of your skin to the harsh desert sun and the uh-huh. flying grit from the constant sandstorms would leave yeah. you with burns and abrasions, not to mention how much moisture you would lose from having true, such yeah. little covering in such a hostile climate. Uh-huh. Now, speaking of that hostile climate, we now see a landscape of Arrakis, followed by a shot of Paul walking along a beach somewhere I'm guessing Caledon because I, I don't remember a lot of oceans on Arrakis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We quickly get a moment of Paul <clears throat> training in the use of his energy armor and fighting knife with his uh, weapons master, Gurney Halleck, played here by Josh Brola. Now, uh-huh. Josh yep. Brola has <laughs> the gravitas. Josh, Josh, to- Josh who? Josh? Brola. Ja Brola. You may remember him as Brola? Tano from the Avenger movie. <laughs> okay, sure. When he took possession of the Infinity Gauntlet and <laughs> was able to eliminate half the universe's population, uh, mm-hmm. a scope only matched by the thousands of years of timeline in the Frank Herbert Dune Saga. Now, there is a voiceover <laughs> stating that Paul has learned to rule himself, but he must now learn to rule others. A premonition both of his role as heir to the Atreides house as a son of Duke Leto, who we shall see is played by Oscar Isaac, and also his oh, wow, greater nailed role that. as Name one. <laughs> because his name is, to be honest, very easy to say, and his role <laughs> as the Quetzal Haderach, who will bring across mm-hmm. a jihad throughout the universe causing the death of billions i assume they will save that for the second movie now <laughs> duke leto as we know played by oscar Arza, i got it the first time and for yeah, some reason could yeah. not Probably stick the landing yeah. the second pronunciation he's at a tomb of some kind we're told by a voiceover he rules a planet but he's going to lose it a quick shot of i assume lady jessica duke leto's mm-hmm. wife and Bell's mother, who of course betrayed the Bene Gesserit plan by not having a daughter and having a son, because as any Dune head knows, the Bene Gesserit can control the gender of their unborn children. Now, yeah. off to the plains oh. of Dune, where they are disembarking oh. from some kind of huge tank or something. It looks a yep. little bit like a Jawa sand crawler, but bigger <laughs> and less featureful. Not since uh, uh, Stuart explained Warhammer to me. Have I been lost in a thicket of just uh, letter soup? Uh Well, don't worry, because it's about to get a lot simpler and more complicated. Because Duke Leo and his family will be greeted by a hardy companion. That's, of course, Duncan Idaho, the other Mm -hmm. weapons master and fighter. Hold on, hold on, wait, wait, hold on, wait. Duncan Idaho, yeah. character in June whose last name is Idaho, which is the Uh name... Very of much a so. State in on in the United States on well, Earth. Remember, Dan, this is set in the far future. Uh-huh. Idaho is still a storied land known oh, throughout okay. for its right. potatoes, the some would say <laughs> life giving essence, second only to the spice in its importance yeah. to the galactic economy. Uh-huh. Idaho, of course, a taking an El Dorado type position in yeah, the yeah. universe. He is, of course, played by. Jason Momoa, who is best uh-huh. known as, I, at this point, I assume, Aquaman from the DC movies. Now, uh-huh. there's a brief shot of, so brief I had to watch it again to tell that it was, of course, <laughs> Stilgar, leader of the Fremen tribe at Siege Tabor, played here by Javier Bardem, the uh-huh. villain from the James Bond movie where he's the bad guy in it. Uh-huh. The- yep, he's- <laughs> <laughs> that one. Okay. Uh, we hear from someone that Arrakis is a death trap over massed armies. Perhaps these armies are at the command of the next person we see, Beast Raban, Count of Lankaville, and eldest nephew of the Baron Harkonnen. He's played by Dave Bardetta. And, of mm-hmm. course, the yep. Fremen people of Arrakis, as you, I'm surely know, know him as Mudir Nahia, which translate roughly as demon ruler. Now, of course, we only see him for but a moment before we are introduced to his boss and uncle, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, who is looking Uh very foggy and is played by Stalin Skarsgar. Now, there is a lot of uh, fire and bad things. Jessica looks very concerned, but we've got more characters to meet in this trailer. For instance, Dr. Wellington Yule, played by Chang Mm -hmm. Chen, who, as we all know, will go on to betray the Atreides family, kind of. 
Now, I assume he is a distinct descendant of one Stuart Wellington, yeah. uh, since, again, this takes place in the far future. We see yep. some armored <laughs> bad dudes, real badass fighter Wait, types. I assume these dudes? are the... Uh-huh. Wait, they no, got to say the president. Game, bad dudes? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. No, they are, in fact, probably, I'm guessing, the Sardaukar, the fanatically elite fighting force of the emperor. Then we get a shot of Paul walking purposely toward the camera. Uh, Duncan Idaho, again played by Jason Mama, is, uh-huh. says, let's fight like demons, and then starts fighting uh, people in armor as they run at him. Back to the reverend mother of the Bene Gesserit, as she says, an animal caught in a trap will gnaw off its own leg. What will you do? There's a shot of Chani standing outside. We see Paul in his still suit, uh-huh. Chani in her still suit, spaceships, explosions. At this part, to be honest, it just looks like a bigger budget version of the David Lynch Dune, but without the score by Toto. There's uh, Baron Harkonnen, I assume, emerging from a sort of apocalypse now mud bath. And here is where we get to the portion of the trailer I call the walking purposefully towards the camera. Lady Jessica walks purposefully uh-huh, towards the camera. Played by Rebecca Ferguson. Played by Rebecca Ferguson. Duck uh-huh. in Idaho salutes with a blade. Paul salutes with a blade. Paul watches from his airship as a sand pit swallows a kind of sand crawler. Dr. Wellington Yu walks purposefully toward the camera. There's a Fremen lady, a dragonfly helicopter. Then Robin Harkonnen, the beast, walks purposefully towards the camera. Duke Leto looks kind of sad. And Paul says, I see you. I don't think he's referring to the shot from before. That's kind of a Kuleshov experiment in juxtaposition uh-huh. and editing. We'll have to see the final version. Another quick <laughs> shot of Stilgar. I assume Javier Bardem was not a big enough star to get his face in the trailer that much. Then there's some text that says beyond fear Duncan Idaho walks purposefully towards the camera then Mm -hmm. destiny awaits Zendaya's hair in slow-mo Paul yells in slow-mo and now Paul launches into a shortened version of the litany against fear which in the original book goes like this (laughs) I must not fear Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. I, of course, recited this before every episode of NBC Nightly News <laughs> for my 22 years of hosting that storied program. It was a little wink at Dune, as if to say to the planet Arrakis, I'll be back to you in a half hour when I'm <laughs> done dealing with this small, blue, pitiful planet of the distant past that we call Earth. Okay. Then there's some flying right. machines. I mean, like, that, someone, I mean, like, someone, someone, we're almost done with the trailer, Daniel. Earth, someone, might, <laughs> Earth might have problems, but it's not built on a... On an intergalactic drug trade. I mean... Uh, now who's being naive, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> That's it's called it. oil. It, there's a re- there's, it's not that hard to look at the metaphors. They're rich and thick like a good gumbo. Not, uh-huh. and not unlike the exact opposite of Inception, which is sort of a uh, killer's mask, a sociopath's public face, behind which <laughs> lies nothing. Now, someone dips their hand in sand. Uh, Duncan Idaho kneels and calls Paul the Duke. Paul walks in slow-mo purposefully towards the camera, and you Mm -hmm. think the trailer is almost over when you're thinking to yourself, how have I not seen a sandworm? It's perhaps (laughs) the most notable thing about Arrakis is these giant freaking worms that the Fremen (laughs) ride and worship as the makers when suddenly the ground erupts and people run away. It's a sandworm, not looking unlike, say, a sarlacc that has been pulled inside out, Uh like a prolapsed colon, if you will, of a sarlacc. Looks like a butt. We get the title, Dune. End of trailer and much of this trailer uh is uh is also scored to a cover of eclipse by pink floyd now are you now what do you what how do you feel about that tom what uh, what are your pink floyd feelings to be honest i w- if i had known i think i would have been fine with it but i was so so, I was so in the world of Arrakis that I was actually humming the soundtrack I had composed to the book when I read mm-hmm. it so that I yep. and it goes something like Dune Arrakis 
da dun Arrakis. It's got a very Thomas Dolby feel when the lyrics <laughs> yeah, yeah. kick in. It certainly did at the end. Some started elements of uh, Danny Elfman in there. It started kind of like the Price is Right theme, and then it got, yeah, it got a little more uh, Thomas Dolby. There was a period when, outside of hosting the nightly news, I was only reading Dune and watching The Price is Right. Yeah. Uh, it was a low point in my life when I really lost track of who I was as a person and also reality. And, uh-huh. of course, a series of hypnotic suggestions had to be planted by the world's most noted hypnotherapists in order to uh-huh. snap me out of that fugue state for the 30 minutes it took to tape NBC Nightly <laughs> News. I would repeat the words phonetically as they were read in to my ear because at that point I had lost the ability to speak American English and I only spoke the languages of Frank Herbert. Uh, well, you know, I, I now that we've uh, gone through the trailer, I know you've got more to say, Tom, but uh, I feel like it's a good time to take a little break to thank our sponsor for this episode, uh, Stitch Fix, who I'm sure is happy that they bought a uh, an ad on our most accessible episode, like one that makes a lot of sense to everyone and isn't built on sort of a, a, a long-running uh, uh, in-joke. But uh, Stitch Fricks, hey, wouldn't it be great if every... I, I think they probably would appreciate it more if you pronounce the name of the company correctly, <laughs> since yeah. I don't believe that Fricks, F-R-I-X, is a word. Stitch Fix. But no, yeah. but you're right, Dan. I'm the one who's at fault here. <laughs> People should go to Stitch Fricks's website and use their fine product, or perhaps Stitch Fixed, who bought time on the program. Continue, Dan. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Sticks. St- <laughs> Again, I Sticks. Said- I don't know how that was going to end, but Sticks Fix and Sticks Fitch are not also again. At this point, I think he's just fucking with us, Tom. <laughs> It's it's interesting that I didn't know how to pronounce Timothy Chalamon's name, and I was made the butt of ridicule. And yet you have trouble with Stitch Fix. All right, okay, hold on. Take, take three. Stitch Fix. Wouldn't it be great if every clothing store you shopped at had only your size, what styles you like, and at the price you want? Well, Stitch Fix is a personal styling company that makes getting the clothes you love effortless. To get started, go to stitchfix.com slash flophouse to set up your profile, and they'll deliver great looks personalized just for you in your colors, styles, and budget. You pay a $20 styling fee for each fix, which is credited towards anything you keep. Schedule at any time. There's no subscription required. Plus, shipping, returns, and exchanges are easy and free. You can get started today at stitchfix.com slash flophouse, and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash flophouse for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. I'll say it one more time because they highlighted it. stitchfix.com slash flophouse. Nailed it. Wow. Okay. So now that we've... That's, uh, that's what we in the business and broadcasting call a done-in-one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so now, now ha- we've, we've gone over the trailer. And yes, and I, and I do have... Uh, thank you for asking. I do have some broad thoughts to relay yeah, about yeah. the trailer and this new vision that Dennis Villeneuve has for Frank Herbert's masterpiece. Can this be Dune. a new reoccurring segment called Broad Thoughts? Sure. Or, or if it ain't broke, uh, don't fix it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so in this episode of If It Ain't Broke, Call, Don't Fix It, we'll get to the trailer of Dune, uh, and we're also brought to you by Stitch Fix. Sometimes <laughs> stitches do need fixing, and that's what Wait. Stitch Fix is but, for. Yeah, but, well, okay, but if it ain't broke, uh, don't fix it. So are you asking us to fix you, Tom Brokaw? Is that this is a cry I think for this, help? This whole episode has clearly been a cry for help in many different ways. And if you didn't catch on to it until now, that's your problem. Now, something that I find... First, I'll go with... Uh, I'll make a classic shit sandwich where I will start with a compliment. Sure, I will yeah. then have a criticism, and then I will have a compliment. And uh-huh, so, yeah. uh, there's a lot of uh, Takes walking... Takes the sting out. So, yeah, here's, here's my first compliment. 
I love the walking purposefully towards the camera. <clears throat> this is a world yeah. of people with strong purposes, and they've got to walk places, and that camera is in their way. So I can't wait to see what happens when they reach the camera with that purposeful walking. Also, it's excitingly beige. It is a limited color palette on the planet of Arrakis, and they <laughs> yeah. have steered into the curve of that. Now, off of the compliments onto the major criticism, something I was screaming out loud while watching the trailer when it dropped a scant few days ago, uh, where is Fade Rautha Rabin, the yeah. other nephew of Baron Harkonnen, mm -hmm. some would say <laughs> the better nephew, the handsome, cunning, and vain nephew that the Baron is choosing to make his heir, and who figures quite heavily into the climactic fight between him and Paul Atreides. Now, Daniel, you may remember this character as the one played by Sting in the David Lynch I, I version. I do remember. That, uh -huh. is, that is one he of says, He says, I will kill him! Yes, that, that's... He, as as mentioned, he says, I will kill him. That Did is you, his famous line. Do you, do you want to know what the top three images... I recall from the David Lynch version. Yeah, sure. Drop them on me. Uh, number one, shirtless Sting. Yeah. Number two, in his little, in his tiny space underpants. Yeah. <laughs> number two, I think it's, I think it's Harkonnen uh, with all the boils on his face. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the Baron Vladimir. Uh, I remember that, and of course, uh, the big like like brain looking thing in the tank. The third the navigator. stage navigator. Yes. Yeah. The one who looks kind of like a cross between a fetus, a turtle and a scrotum, but enormous mm -hmm. floating in a tank of some kind of amber sort of liquid. That's what happens when you take too much of the spice from Arrakis. Uh, it's, it's, not related to the gum jabbar. So those are your two choices, Dan. You can either put yourself through the pain test or you can be that guy. What's it going to be? Uh, I think we know which one Dan would pick. I mean, he that, guy to be that guy <laughs> seems like he's having a pretty good time. Like it's just like he's just like floating in a tank. That's like he is, back in he the, is the womb. It is the closest that anyone in Dune gets to kicking back. So yeah. I understand your choice. <laughs> <laughs> also not seen in the trailer is uh, Peter DeVries, the evil Mentat. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure he'll, he's going to pop up possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and now, so my rage at not seeing Fade Rotha, some would say the most uh, intriguing non-Paul character in the yeah. book, uh, was a disappointment. But, however, and here is a final compliment. It was exciting to see Charlotte Rampling in the role of <laughs> Bene Gesserit uh, Reverend Mother Guys Helen Mayim. Uh, it reminded me of, in some ways, maybe an older version of her character of Consuela from the movie Zardoz. A hmm. similar film in some ways, and perhaps one that I will draw connections to when I'm watching. Wow, that's uh, a that's a pretty exhaustive summary of this trailer. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the exhaustive. That's, that's I'm a fucking professional. I'm a broadcast pro, you son. So, Dan, bitch. how excited would you be if you were just hanging out on like a sandy beach or a mm -hmm. desert or something, and a giant worm popped out of the ground and it had a giant gaping butthole for a head? It is a real anus of a face for this worm. I I gotta say. Uh, sandworm wise, this is my third favorite. That's the face sand... of God you're talking about, Tim. <laughs> this is the third favorite uh, sandworm I've seen after uh, the Beetlejuice sandworm and That's the original uh, David Lynch sandworm. Mm -hmm. uh, any other sandworms kind of fall by the wayside for you? Uh, I mean, the <laughs> yeah. Who didn't make it into the top three, Dan? Well, uh, why are the graboids saw... not in there? There's a worm I saw in the sand when I went. Uh, to the beach as like a two-year-old when I visited California for the first time. Oh, man. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of fun here tonight. Dan, Not, uh, Tom Brokaw, me, dude. <laughs> yep, that's the only three people who are here. You, me, and Tom Brokaw, and no one else. Well, Tom, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm sure you probably have something really important to do later. Uh, it's where are you in New York or LA right now? Well, you could say that mentally, there's only one place I ever am, no matter New where my physical body is. New York or LA? 
as Arrakis. Uh, oh, if, if, right. Physically, of course, I'm on my compound in Bozeman, Montana, as I ride out what yeah. I think is the first stages of the apocalypse, yeah. uh, and I continue through the middle and final stages as they lead inevitably to the future first seen by the Kwisatz Haderach. Oh, uh, that's now, great. So, uh, normally, whenever we have a guest on, we ask if they have anything they want to plug. You got anything you yeah. want to plug, Tom? Uh, just the novel Dune by Frank Herbert. Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I didn't I mean, write it myself, but it, at this point, it's hard for me to tell where I begin and Dune ends. We uh-huh. have become so much one mind and one body. Not so much the sequels to Dune, which trail off quite a bit, but the original novel, yes, very much so. I mean, I've been watching your Instagram account, Tom, and I keep seeing you posing uh, wrapped up in a sleeping bag like you're the sandworm on the cover of God Emperor of Dune. Uh, Is that intentional? Is that a little Easter egg for the Dune heads? (laughs) I'm uh, glad that you got that reference, Stuart. That was very much how I intended it. Uh, In fact, I've been doing a series of photos, only some of which I've shared with the public, in which I reenact Scenes and iconic images from Dune playing all of the characters <laughs> myself. And occasionally I put on silly clothes and pretend to be the dogs from William Wegman's photography. You know, when there's the two dogs that wear human clothes. But uh, those photos crazy. just come out as me wearing human clothes, <laughs> which doesn't have quite the effect of a dog wearing, uh, say, a human trench coat and a hat. But so you're holding a sign that says you're a hat. dog, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, to make it clear, I had to put a sign around my neck that says, imagine I am a dog right now. Uh-huh. And what I'm, it's at a certain point, the concept becomes slightly muddy. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you hired Bobby Moynihan to stand in the background of every picture uh, dressed up like a dog catcher? <laughs> Not every picture, but many of them. Yes, just, just to the, help not drive the home ones. the point. Just help to drive home the point that I am a dog, and also to have a little bit of fun. Bobby is out here on the ranch with me in Bozeman, and together we will begin a new civilization when the current one falls. Would it be based around the teachings of the Princess Irulan in the book Dune? Well... <laughs> I think you could probably guess the answer to that. (laughs) Well, uh, I'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, So I guess you're plugging your Instagram. And uh, one last question before you go. Yeah, my my Instagram, if it ain't broke off, Dune fix it. (laughs) <laughs> that's very, the full that's very, the full handle very confusing but uh, uh before you go, and there's there's no spelled in a very innate. complicated way i think <laughs> <laughs> before you go i did want to ask uh you know if there's one character name that from the book that you uh didn't get to say that you just would like to throw in here at the very end this would be the time uh but if there's nothing don't feel uh, pressured by me, the Tom Brokaw Dune fanboy. I mean, it doesn't. No one in the characters, but if you'd like me to go over the cast of the film again, of course, that's <laughs> Dune coming out uh, this year, starring Timothy Jalama, and of huh? course, there's Dave Bautista, Stellan uh-huh. Skarsgård, Charlotte yep. Rampling, Oscar mm-hmm. Isaac, Zendaya, yep. Javier Bardem, Josh Brolin, Jason Momoa, and uh, Chan Chan, and of course, uh, Rebecca Ferguson. So that's the cast of the film Dune. It was, of course, directed by Dennis Villeneuve, and the screenplay is by Dennis Villeneuve, Eric Roth, and John Spahn. The music is by Hans Zimmer, with cinematography by Greg Brasa, edited by Joe Wire, production company's legendary fashion, Warner Brothers release. The cover of this summer is in multiple days, produced by Cavana, Joe Carasola, Junior, Mary Parent, Dennis Villano, and of course the makeup and costumes of <laughs>
Uh, he should probably introduce himself. Well, hello, yeah. gentlemen. It's oh. me, Tom Broca, America's a... favorite newsman. And I have to say, I had to come here from my complex in Bozeman, Montana, when I heard that Elliot was hoping to do a Flophouse Mini without asking me to join and talk about the movie event of the third millennium. That's right, the new adaption. Of Dune, uh, the movie event oh, of the wow. second millennium, of course, oh, was Tom the, Brokaw, yeah, yeah, it was the 1984 adaptation of Dune, and the movie event of the first millennium was the Bible, I guess. Uh, Dan, do you have any <laughs> questions? Uh, now that I'm here, I, I very much wanted to talk about the film yeah. Dune, which no, opened in theaters the Dune, weekend before, before we record this. Uh, yes, be Daniel? Before you uh, do that, uh, maybe you should just explain to our younger listeners who the hell you are. Just <laughs> just because they may only know you as a, a, a Dune fanatic. Uh, it's. Po I mean, at this point, that is pretty much my... Full time occupation is spreading the gospel of Frank Herbert's uh, brilliant Dune mm -hmm. novel series. But uh, some may know me as the. Your, your, ask your parents about me, and they'll tell you that I was the longtime host of NBC Nightly News and perhaps the most trusted man in American broadcasting for uh -huh. quite some time. I also co wrote the uh, bestseller, The Greatest Generation, uh, the story <laughs> of the men and women who fought World War II. It's an epic tale, uh. Uh, almost as exciting and as inspiring as that of Paul Atreides, the heir of House Atreides, as he makes his way from callow youth to the <laughs> Kwisatz Haderach, the one who is seeking to uh -huh. bring enlightenment to the universe, but instead yeah. contributes only violence and conflict in the end, and eventually has a descendant who becomes a big sandworm. It's amazing in a later <laughs> book. Uh, so that's, about so that's that, me, yeah. Tom Brokaw, but you perhaps know me best as Dunehead number one. <laughs> yep. <laughs> No, uh, that, that, yeah, that, I don't know. I don't know anything about uh, the story where it goes after the uh, initial novel. So this is interesting. <laughs> this, well, this throw, now... out, throw out everything you think you know about Dune, Dan, or Dan okay. Dune, or Dune's Berry, which I was very disappointed to discover years ago was not a comic strip adaptation of Dune, the novel, uh, or in fact a delicious berry, which <laughs> when you ate it gave yeah. you the knowledge of the Dune series. It is in fact a political comic yeah. strip following a uh, ever-expanding yeah. cast yeah. of characters mm -hmm. uh, as they just live in these, this modern America. But Dan, mm -hmm. uh, so it's, a, it's an amazing ride. I highly, I highly advise you to take it. And uh, if you gentlemen yeah. have no... Uh, Objection! I think it's time for another installment of my recurring segment. If it mm. ain't a Brokaw, Dune, fix it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. What's, I guess uh, we what's can. your? Uh, so I'm assuming you saw this in the movie theater because you want yeah. the full experience, right? I you very. Mu I did not see it. Well, that I did watch it both in the theater and at home to see if it was a full second screen experience. The second mm. screen was an iPad with Dune playing on it as I watched <laughs> Dune on my large television. Uh, I call my iPad my small television and my <laughs> regular television my large television. I refer to movie screens as a big, big television. So I did uh -huh. see it first on the big, big television. Uh, first yeah. by myself, uh, secondly with my wife, Lorraine Bracco, and then third, uh -oh. I saw it uh, in 4D where your chair shakes when the spaceships are going up and down. Uh -huh. Then I watched it at home on the small television and also the, the teeny tiny television is that what i called them before i don't remember uh yeah. but yes i've seen it a few times now uh, like in a, the past like few days. four or five screens what's uh experience. what was your uh what was your what was your snack of choice <laughs> well i wanted to say to myself what would they eat in the world of dune so of course uh -huh, i had yeah. a tube going it's into my point. mouth that was attached to my own sweat glands so mm -hmm. i could recycle my uh my moisture like the fremen yeah. on arrakis would do uh -huh. and otherwise there's not a lot of food in Dune, and so I mostly ate sand and worms. <laughs> mm, Just mm. a big bowl of worms and sand. I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. Now, Sounds delicious. Okay, cool. Does, when one uses the spice as a as a drug rather than a, a means of interstellar travel, do, do you eat that, or is that a... Do you inhale it? I uh, I was unclear about that element of the, the grains the spice. of the spice are so small that you can. It's uh, more tr uh, more trouble not to inhale them, and that is why oh, it certainly. suffuses the air of the planet. And if you spend too much time on Arrakis, you will become a spice addict who cannot live for long outside of the planet itself without a supply of 
spice. Spice mm. melange, yeah. 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 The, it must so, flow. Uh, did either either of you, and I, this, I know this is a foolish question, did either of you uh, see the film? Uh, of course, knowing that it is a, it, it was perhaps the defining cultural event of our generation. I include you both in my generation, although I am <laughs> roughly 30 yep. years older than you. <laughs> well, I saw it, uh, yeah, I saw it uh, two days ago. Stuart, did you see it? I have tickets to see it tomorrow, but oh. last also, night I played Dune Imperium, the board game version of the movie. Oh, wow. I played the role of Paul Atreides, and I lost to uh, the Harkonnens. Well, uh, spoiler alert, that's not what happens in the story. <laughs> uh, I, I apologize. I, I will have many spoilers to talk about, I'm sure. But that's fine. to be honest, if you haven't read Dune by now, are you even really human? Probably not. And so no. I have no compunction about spoiling a story you should have read. I also just looked myself up on Wikipedia and realized I am about 40 <laughs> years older than you, not 30 years. And still, I consider oh, us you. all the same generation, Generation Dune, those of us who are here for the year 1 AD, that is, after Dune, uh, which yep. all time will be considered from now on. Now, uh, Daniel and St – so, Stuart, did you did see the movie before playing the game or you did not? I have not seen the movie yet, although I did hear we did get some good news today. Dune 2. It's on the way. It was announced today that move. Dune Part 2 will be coming to theaters in the year 2023. Uh, and a very long time to wait to find the ending of the series, but the, you know, it's. I feel like they made the right choice by splitting the film into two so that you could really spend a lot of time walking through the desert just looking mm -hmm. at how beige everything is. Uh, mm -hmm. Dan, what were your thoughts about the film? I know what my thoughts are. What are yours? Uh, well, you know what? I've, I've read the book once, the first book. Uh, it seemed to be a pretty... Uh, a pretty faithful adaptation of the first half of the first book. Um, I found it a little. It didn't bloodless. bother you. It didn't bother you what? that there were no quotes oh. from the princess Arulin, uh telling us about what about the future of Maud Dib. <laughs> oh, that's right. There are those little quotes that uh, enter the thing. You can call uh, them little quotes. I think they encompass a galaxy <laughs> of wisdom. <laughs> that's true. I forgot about that element. <laughs> uh, no, I, I thought it was a very, very beautiful uh, movie. I liked Oscar Isaac and Rebecca Ferguson's performances. What? You uh, love two great actors? Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they are. Uh, I, I found it a little bit of a, a, a pretty... Uh, uh, it's like looking at a very pretty diorama that I wasn't that engaged by uh, narratively. But uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I understand that. You have to keep in mind that inevitably any adaptation of Frank Herbert's work is akin to looking at the world through a keyhole. There's only so much <laughs> they can provide of the uh, macrocosm mm -hmm. that exists within that beautiful tale. Uh, I uh, so, so at least you felt uh, like you were enjoying the experience, even if it didn't enrapture you the way that, say, the book Dune might. <laughs> I enjoyed the first two hours and it was then was kind of bored by the last 30 minutes. But uh, So yeah, you weren't uh, as much of a fan of the scenes where they were just walking through the sand? <laughs> yeah, those, those got a little samey. <laughs> I have to admit that uh, I had a few similar thoughts about it. I thought it was a very fine adaptation of the film. Uh, there, I did not mind the... Uh, walking through the sand, but at the same time, I did have to leave the theater very briefly during that sequence. Uh, perhaps I was overcome by seeing this world brought to life before me. Perhaps I had had just uh, too much Coca-Cola and had to <laughs> eject the extra fluid from my bladder. That was, in fact, what happened, and I remember being angry at my own urine stream at how long it was taking to yeah. leave my body and get mm -hmm. me back into the theater. Perhaps if I had been wearing a still suit, I would have just let it flow knowing it would come back to me as drinkable mm -hmm. water and stayed yeah. in my seat watching the film. Another, it's, it's the strange thing is that I did not learn my lesson and had to leave to use the bathroom at the same exact point every time I watched the film. <laughs> wow. Even And I had it on my phone uh, to watch it that sequence while I was using the bathroom, and yet somehow I still managed to miss the scene. I suppose it was hard to hold my own manhood and hold the phone steady and watch the mm -hmm. screen without causing quite a mess. And so there is a sequence when he was walking through the sand that I was not completely privy to. But keeping that in mind, I feel like I got the gist of the major narrative. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. I think you're safe, yeah. yeah. Now, you it's, mentioned Oscar Isaac and Rebecca Ferguson. Did you yeah. have trouble? <laughs> Did you not approve of the other performances in the film? I thought Timothy Chalamet acquitted himself quite fine, and uh, Zendaya did what she could with a role that was essentially just her looking at the camera with her hair blowing around her. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> the uh, the marketing of this has uh, foregrounded Zendaya, and that you know she's a she's a wonderful, uh, very charismatic actress and personality. I understand why they would do that, but yes, uh, I can only <laughs> assume that uh, you know, because her character doesn't come into the book uh, until after what the movie covers, uh, they were like, hmm, how can we shoehorn as much of this uh, charismatic performer into our movie as possible? Let's just have a bunch of flash forwards of her sort of, uh, yeah, looking wistful in front of the say, sunlight. Yeah, the amount of screen time she has as Chani, it was not enough yet to topple her as Michi in my particular <laughs> understanding yeah, of Zendaya's yeah, career. Uh, now, Stuart, when you were playing uh, Dune Imperium, uh, uh -huh. what was it that you felt lost you the game? How how did you fail as Paul Atreides, as he could very well fail, if he takes the wrong path and makes the wrong decision? Uh, my uh, I had made a uh, a play for the uh, for in a battle, and I thought I had won it, but I was betrayed by another player who won the battle, but ended up losing both of us the game. So I guess I'd focus too much on military strength. Mm. Hmm. It seems like you, in a way, uh, lived the experience not of Paul, but of Duke Leto after having put his faith into his doctor, only to be Dr. Wellington Yu, played by Chang mm -hmm. Chen, uh, only to be betrayed. Spoiler alert, but again, you should have read the book by now. You should yeah. know these things are happening. Or seen the other movie. Or yeah. seen the other movie, the one directed by Alan Smithy, uh, a talented <laughs> young director. I don't know what else he's done, but uh, he did <laughs> well, a fine said, job uh, with it. <laughs> He did Burn Dune. Hollywood Burn, an Alan Swithy film. Uh, <laughs> I'm not familiar with it. Is it like Dune? <laughs> well, <laughs> they were both not successful. Uh, I would say that the Dune from 1984 is successful on its own terms, which is as a crazy kind of spaghetti mess of a movie. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I meant just uh, you know, in, in a larger, in a larger sort of financial sense. Yes, yes, yes. I think part of the problem was in the uh, their understanding of the Dune series. Uh, it was uh, very much in 1984 seen as a new kind of Star War, and it is very much not a Star War. Now, this movie, on the other hand, one of the few issues I had with it was that it could have used a little bit more of that kind of Star War joy. It's a very bleak movie yeah. and a very downbeat movie, very dour. And in fact, it would have seemed even more dour if my screening had not followed the trailer for the new Batman movie, which seems like a true <laughs> descent into hell, a, a grim vision of a world in which no one exists but criminals and victims, and in which the supposed hero Batman is invulnerable and wades through bullet fire to smash men's heads against walls. Truly, it made my tummy hurt uh, and made me wonder what was happening in the America I did so much to chronicle in my career when this is the kind of escapist entertainment we're looking for when the hero literally says I'm vengeance and then in the, the last seen, the last image is him walking towards a burning car in order to beat a man to a pulp. It seems like not the Batman I knew and fell in love with uh, when no. Adam West played him. I don't remember any episodes of the old show where Adam West beat a man to a pulp or was shot point blank in the chest or told anyone that he was vengeance. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, mean, I just remember the one where he runs around with a bomb. That was yeah. well, hilarious. That's the movie. That's, in, uh, that's, that's a oh, 1966 film. Well, it's, it's, so but I, it's the film adaptation of the show. I can only imagine that if the current Batman, played by Robert Pattinson, was faced <laughs> with, with a similar bomb problem, he would take the bomb and slam it so hard into a bad man's head that the man's head would shatter and then the bomb would of course explode sending fragments into the bodies of several other people. <laughs> Truly a horrible world that I cannot wait to not visit and not experience but you know me, I'm kind of a geek in th completist so I may need to go see it and just wade through yeah. the bile and feces that is the new Batman movie. Certainly a river of sewage poured into multiplexes nationwide. 
Sounds great. Now, Dan, I believe that there is a promo for this episode. Perhaps it's time to throw to it now. <laughs> sure, right after a river of sewage. Uh, this uh, episode of The Flop House, uh, 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 nominally a podcast about bad movies, is, is sponsored by Smalls. Smalls. It's a... Uh... It's a it's a food for cats. Give your feline friend yeah. protein packed meals they'll crave with Smalls. And uh, what makes Smalls special? Well, it's fresh, human grade food for cats delivered right to your doorstep. All cats are obligate carnivores. They need fresh, protein packed meals. Conventional cat food is made using low quality, cheap meat byproducts. Grains and starches coated in artificial flavors. Meat byproducts are good enough for you at the baseball game, but not a, not good enough for your cat friend. With the help of cat nutrition, Wait, Smalls, are you taking the cat to the baseball game? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just making a comparison. The cat oh, I was going to say the... because uh, would you? I would wonder then. Would you have to buy a seat to place the carrier on mm. it, or are you putting it in your lap, or are you just holding the cat? Because if so, that is a very well trained cat. Well, there's that cat that ran across the field at what Yankee Stadium mm -hmm. this season, and that was the highlight of the game. Yeah, that yeah. Was, so that was maybe true. maybe maybe yeah. you want maybe you want to bring your own highlight to the game. <laughs> yeah, with the help of cat nutritionists, Smalls, which is what we're advertising, uh, believe it or not, develops complete and balanced recipes for all life stages. Smalls recipes are gently cooked to lock in protein, vitamins, minerals, and moisture. Better quality ingredients mean a better, healthier life for your cat. Since switching to Smalls. Cats have experienced improved digestion and a less less smelly litter box, softer and shinier coats, plus better breath. And as a cat owner myself, I know that uh, what a cat eats has a huge effect on health, breath, happiness, softness of fur. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just, you know, why don't you make your cat happy? Take a short quiz on smalls.com slash flop. To customize your sampler and use code FLOP for a total of 30% off your first order. That's smalls.com slash FLOP, code FLOP. I will say, uh, I also am a, a fan. Uh, I uh, take very good care of my three cats, Paul Catrades, Dunk Cat Idaho, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, Baron Harkitten. They're the <laughs> loves of my life. I just take look at my, my, my wife, Lorraine Bracco, sometimes jokes that uh, I love the cats more than I love her, uh -huh. which, is, of uh -huh. course, which, uh, which is, of course, a joke. There's no one I, I love do. more than my wife, uh, Lorraine Bracco. We call ourselves the Bracco Brocos, or sometimes the Bracco uh -huh. Brocos. Do you call their litter box Arrakis? <laughs> uh, I would. I feel like it would be a bit disrespectful uh, to the planet itself. To is there more than just a place for my cats to deposit their waste? But you know that's a funny idea, and perhaps I'll bring it into my regular slang vocabulary during the day. Mm. Uh, okay. Let, now, I have. I let have. Us a, know. Yeah, I, I will let you know. I'll keep you updated on that uh, as I fold that term into my regular cat box discourse uh, and perhaps I'll tell my wife Lorraine Rocco that I have to go and uh, and go and search Arrakis for Paul Catrades. She'll know of course that I'm not really looking for the cat but for of course yeah. his waist. Uh, Sandworms. I enjoyed the film but as I have to say as I spent time away from it I did find things about it not totally sitting right for me and the main thing is somewhat the bleakness of it and the beigeness of it. It's a very overwhelmingly beige film and there's a certain richness and filigree quality to the ceremony and culture in the books which is not I think fully reflected in the very brutalist architecture and kind of muted costuming of the film. One thing that uh, really struck me was that uh, the Atreides house, it's very clear, is not right for Dune. They are not ready for the challenge of Arrakis and they will be overwhelmed by it. And yet when they arrive, they're already wearing what I would call Dune tones rather than the earth tones, the greens and so forth, you would expect from a forested planet like Caladon. And I kind of wish that the uh, Atreides, House Atreides legions had been dressed in armor that was not fittingly colored for Arrakis uh, as a way to show how out of place they were. That's just an idea that Denny Villeneuve can borrow from me for <laughs> Dune Part 2, or if he would like to do a Dune Part 1 special edition in which he uses yep. CGI to change the colors of the uniforms, much as George Lucas has done in his Star Wars films. Uh, but uh -huh. of course, my largest uh, problem with it is 
As I mentioned, when I talked about the trailer of the film, uh, my previous uh, <laughs> If It Ain't Broke Hot, Dune Fix It segment was the absence of Fade Rutha. Where is mm -hmm. Fade Rutha Raban, the uh, other evil nephew of Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, who, again, as we mentioned, is played by Sting in the other film, and mm -hmm. uh, has a memorable climactic duel with Paul Atreides. Now, I understand from a screenwriting point of view. It makes sense to give your villain one evil nephew rather than uh, two evil nephews. And uh, it, it, the idea of uh, Dave Bautista playing Fade Rotha, he is laughably large to play that part. He can only play the Beast. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume they've collapsed those characters just into this one nephew of the Beast Rabbi, and that he will have the climactic fight with Paul Atreides. And if you fellows uh, disagree with me, I'm willing to put a little bit of uh, money on it uh, and we'll see who actually is right about whether there will be a climactic Paul Atreides Dave Bautista fight in Dune Part 2. So, what's the action you guys are willing to give me on this? Uh... I, don't I should know mention I'm, that I what? have a Dune-based gambling addiction. I've been known oh, to gamble on sure. what is going to happen in the books, which is strange because I've read them all and know what's yeah. going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I will oftentimes <laughs> bet my wife that they will have changed since the last time I read them. So alive do I find the story, and I am always wrong and I always lose. Uh, Luckily, we share a bank account, so I don't actually yeah. lose the money, but I do lose yeah. a certain amount of face, and thus my masculinity comes into question. So what uh, odds are you willing to give me? on this very <laughs> good bet yeah i don't know that i i'm sorry i can't take that action although i do i do appreciate the idea i think it would be very funny to see a movie in which timothy Ch chalamet fights dave bautista <laughs> I th not funny i think it's going to happen daniel it's a <laughs> i mean i i mean it, i i i, I, I uh, whether or not it happens has it's no going to happen, Dan. Or oh, do you or would you like? Idea or would you like to bet me otherwise? <laughs> yeah, it, it appears. Uh, it appears Tom has access to the Benny Gesserit uh, oh, sisterhood. Okay. Now, if only, if only I did. Although they are quite frightening in real life, as we saw from Charlie Rambling's <laughs> performance <laughs> as the the, as the, uh, the supreme mother of them. Now uh, the uh, the Reverend Mother. Now I, I imagine it would not be that different from the big fight I assume ends the movie Stuber between Dave Bautista and Kamel Nanjiani. Which I have not again seen yeah. the film, but I assume they have a fight to the death at the very end. <laughs> They're on the same side. Uh, uh, I haven't, I, the, yes. the commercials and posters made it seem like Kumail was very afraid of Mr. Batista, and well, I can only assume sure. it's a movie like Collateral, in which Tom Cruise and Jamie <laughs> right. Foxx were very much not on the same side, <laughs> but on very different sides. I don't know. They seem like they were doing pretty well, but I had to stop it about two thirds of the way through. Yeah. Why did you also have to use the bathroom? Was that the reason? I did, and that's why I stopped the movie entirely is because I'm like, I had to go home, I had to take a shower after going to the bathroom. Even though it was just a number one, I had to wash everything. Mm. <laughs> is that like... usually your routine? It seems like yeah. a real yeah. a real inconvenience. Well, I also suffered a fair amount of splash damage, if you know what I mean. <laughs> damage? <laughs> do you, yeah, splash... Are you like, do you have acid <laughs> pee, like some kind of xenomorph? Urine. I think uh personal <laughs> question. Next next one, you guys got any more questions about my pee? That, that is a very personal question. I'd like to depersonalize it by asking, do you think the xenomorph has acid pee? Yeah, that's a good it question. would only make sense, but its drool yeah. is not acidic, is it? I think just its blood. If it was peeing blood, I, I would advise the xenomorph is. to see a urologist immediately. <laughs> Well, and you would also think that it would become a much more popular figure to be peeing on car logos than Calvin because mm -hmm. its pee would disintegrate <laughs> those logos. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Well, I mean, maybe the problem is that you can't draw that because you're, the, the, the artist is like, oh, this logo would be gone by now, you know? I mean, yeah, but like, <laughs> but the thing is, it's not like a person pees forever. It's not like they're like capturing a moment that will... Stand forever. You're I mean, saying it's, you're, it's a you're capturing at the very moment that the urine stream arcs up and is just beginning to touch. The... I mean, it seems like that is the way pictures work. Daniel is they <laughs> yeah. they can take yeah. any moment in a in an event. It doesn't just have no, to be the, the last thing. one. This this this, this 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 yeah. The portrait artist is like is just so no. strong. It's why there's such a thing as pictures of ice and not just pictures of <laughs> puddles of water. And yes, do it. Why every portrait is not of a corpse, uh, decayed just to bones. <laughs> <laughs> I find it fascinating, Daniel, that at this point in your life, you still have not fully grasped the mechanics of how time works in still no. imagery. <laughs> now, can we talk about one thing that, like, I... I <laughs> it's your podcast. 
Well, th thank you. Uh, one thing that bothers me about you, like, as the Dune books go on, again, I've only read the first, but it's my understanding that they're very much uh, sort of a questioning of the white messiah, kind of colonizer messiah, uh, the, b b b what's the word I'm looking for? The Savior? The Savior, yeah, sure, that sort of... Uh, Thing. This sort of Lawrence of Arabia, Tarzan type thing where, I mean, <laughs> Tarzan being, I shouldn't equate the two, but where a white person becomes part of another culture and ultimately conquers it and becomes the best one of it. Yes, yeah. And, and saves uh, it from some other thing or another. Last Samurai or... Yeah, uh, your last Samurais, your, uh, mm, uh, what are some other ones? I'm, I'm forgetting some other ones. I'm sure there are very many. Your uh, John Carter with Wolves is kind of that, I guess. Yeah, sure. You're dancing with the wolves. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I just, you know, but in the context of just the first book, which, which turns, you know, like foreboding at the end, but is, is still kind of a triumphant book and uh and certainly the context of just this first part of the movie it's just kind of a a weird thing that the film i don't know has like laid the track to make me know where it's going with it like i the problem with it <clears throat> as a story that is like incomplete you know like there's some weirdness with that especially when i don't know they're like okay you got the the, the white colonizers and sort of the you know, Arabic coded uh, Fremen, but then you've got like the Harkonnens who uh, have the racial problem that a lot of uh, science fiction seems to have, where there's just like one race that's just gross, <laughs> like or or one family that's just like we're a bunch of like really bald, like pale, uh, like blob men. Uh, I don't know. Sounds there's nothing wrong with being bald but i'm saying the way that it's, it's uh, you certainly said up. it in a pejorative way <laughs> that's true <laughs> i, I believe my I friend jk simmons would be very unhappy with you thank yeah. you yeah but do you know what you i'm trying to get at I'm, I'm not to mention my other friend howie mandel <laughs> the number the nights that me and my friends jk and howie drive around in the dune buggy that's what i call yeah. my car and just whoop up the town they're also Big dune heads. Uh, they're, I, I, just, I apologize. They're, just very, they're, I, they're very valuable to me, and I don't appreciate their baldness being used as a pejorative. <laughs> no, no, no. I didn't. I'm, I'm saying that I think the movie uses as a pejorative. I'm, I apologize in general. Uh, I was telling my friend Elliot, who was here before you came, that I'm very tired right now, so I don't think I'm being as articulate as I, I could be. But do you understand mm -hmm. what I'm trying I to understand. get I understand. Not everyone can be as articulate as I am. Yeah. Uh, so... The, I think pronunciation being one of my finest characteristics. Now, mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, I think what you're asking for is partly with a que that uh, you want the answers that part two will provide, but you're not going to get them until part two. No, part of true. the brilliance to me of Dune is that it takes this same sort of Lawrence of Arabia white savior story and mm -hmm. turns it somewhat on its head by showing that the main character understands that by doing this, he is only going to inevitably make the situation worse. And he thinks through his willpower, perhaps he can change that and lead things to a different path. But no, it's impossible. Much like in the story of Oedipus Rex, there is mm -hmm. one destined path. And though each of the characters tries to avoid it, all roads lead to him doing his mom, even though every character <laughs> has tried to not let that happen. And and that ultimately trying not to make it yeah. happen has only led it to happen. Dune is yeah. someone like that. And I feel like if there is another flaw with the film, I feel like it does not fully communicate clearly that Paul Atreides sees ahead of him a future of almost apocalyptic violence and yeah. makes the choice to follow that future, assuming he can change it, but instead locking his destiny in place. One one small problem I had was that when they showed his vision of his hordes decimating whole cultures, that was represented by roughly a bunch of dudes fighting in the desert and the burning <laughs> of a small pile of bodies, when every time I imagine it while reading the book, I'm imagine, imagining thousands, if not millions, of burning piles of corpses as they lay waste to other civilizations attempting to force them to worship the Madib Kusatardak. But I think what you're looking at is that part one is hopefully the setup that 
creates our expectations, and then part two will be the payoff that subverts those mm. expectations by making us question that narrative. It's a bit like judging a joke from the punchline. If I said to you, a man walks into a bar and he says, that's you can't judge the joke off of that. I haven't told you no, the thing you're that right. comes after. Yeah. Of you're course, right. the punchline I'm, being, I'm how it should. The punchline oh, is ouch okay. because he walked into oh. a different kind of bar than you thought he walked oh. into. Yeah, 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 oh my yeah, god! Yeah. Oh my god! No, no, I no. I, I, I think that that's true, and uh, I do think that the problem is it's just hard to give the foreshadowing that's necessary of uh, visions inside his head and like make it clear. It's it's a complex idea for the film to it try and communicate. It is very complex, perhaps better described in prose, uh, or maybe they could have just had a character more clearly say it. It's sometimes, yeah, that's it's true. sometimes <laughs> difficult to know when it's better to have what's called an exposition dump or info dump or ID, meaning info dump, not Independence mm -hmm. Day, which of course is ID4, uh, the hit uh -huh. film, which did not have the plot complexity of Dune, but did have uh, Brent Spiner in it, so you got to give it some credit for that. <laughs> True. Uh, so perhaps it's hard to know when to say it in images and when to say it in words, especially True. since, as Dan has made clear, images can only show the very end of a thing and cannot show <laughs> yeah. the intermediate steps or even the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what that's why they're so useful for fortune telling. Yeah. Oh yes, very much. It's that's why there's the story, the portrait of Dorian Gray is not considered supernatural or even interesting because all <laughs> portraits show the horrible ending of the person who has fainted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a slice of life. It was a very controversial <laughs> book when it came out because people said, "Yeah, we know this. Why did you bother to write a whole book about it?" Mm -hmm. uh. I don't here's know how what's, we got here, here, but I love hey, it. Hey, Oscar Wilde, here's what's truly <laughs> wild that you thought we needed to be told how portraits work. <laughs> you burned them. You really got them. Should be Oscar Wilde, right? Talk about Oscar Wilde. Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> did you guys – here, this is a little off topic, but when you saw the movie Something Wild, okay. did you expect to see Oscar Wilde in the film? Because I did. Yes. I guess I well, forgot I that his think, name is spelled differently. Yeah, that's your mistake. There's a – there is a terminal E on, it on is Wild. The same issue I have every time I watch Wild America, thinking I'm going to see Oscar Wilde's Adventures yeah, in America, yeah. which he had, but instead it's just a nature documentary. Well, what about so, Wild Things? Did you have the same issue? Because he would have loved kept it. Guys, I said, I, I think said, we can all agree that Oscar Wilde would have loved Wild. Oscar things. Wilde would have found its air of sluggish decadence to, and and lugubrious, uh, <laughs> let's call scandal. Yeah, he would have found it really up his alley. Yeah. Oscar Wilde would have given it, I think, four velvet stars. <laughs> In fact, I feel like I want to tell the producers of the film Wilde, and just go ahead and put a blurb from Oscar Wilde on the box. You know he would have loved it. <sighs> now, I think to finish off my thoughts about Dune Part 1 of the film, I think that I was uh, heartened by it. It felt like a nice, straightforward adaption of the story, it did not reach the same heights of transcendence that I find in the book, but then what does? I'm sure if they made a movie of the Bible, it would, which they've never done, but maybe someday, yeah. I'm sure it would not reach the same heights of uh, religious importance for people. Otherwise, they'd stop printing Bibles and they'd just show people that movie, which would be inconvenient when formats <laughs> changed and you'd have to get a whole new one when you bought a DVD player or a Laserdisc or yeah, what have yeah. you. Uh, but I feel like there's promise in there for Dune Part 2, and I just hope that the second part has a little bit more of the um, uh, feeling of life that Her Frank Herbert brings to Arrakis. I would love to see if in the second part, as Paul learns more about life on Arrakis and surviving there, if the planet itself looked less beige and dead and took on more of a vibrancy. It's just another idea I'm throwing out there for Danny Bono to take. Go for it. I will not sue you if you use it. That is fine with me. Uh, but... For if it ain't Brokaw, do and fix it. I've been America's favorite newsman, Thomas J. Brokaw. The J stands for just reading Dune. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, I think I think Elliot originally started this mini, so I'm gonna let him him finish it. Let's. Uh, I just want to say before we do that, uh, this is one of those episodes that makes me delighted and mystified that people 
listen to the show and seem to enjoy it. <laughs> hey guys, uh, I'm back. Tom Brokaw just let me out of the bathroom. He locked me in. I don't know. Oh, I assume wow. I don't yeah. know what he was talking about. I assume probably yeah. locked uh, it with a chair or whatever. Yeah, he he had put a chair up there, and then he said, <laughs> and then he and then he said, "See you, sucker," and just walked out. Um, uh -huh. I guess we're wow. running we're running out of time, so I'm gonna have to uh, talk about Adam Warlock at some future episode. Uh, Do you think they cast that kid because his eyebrows look like Adam Warlock's eyebrows? I have to assume that's what it was. You got to cast eyebrow what first. What do those eyebrows look like? Like kind of pointy on the sides. Oh, pointy. I mean, pointy you can't brow. do that with makeup effects. That's no. like a eyebrows. Well thing. We don't I was, have the technology. I was listening to an interview with Rick Baker. We saying out eyebrows are still the Achilles heel of any makeup artist. It's just impossible. Yeah. So when you mm -hmm. want to have a character with crazy eyebrows, you got to go out and get a crazy eyebrow person. You know, or train two caterpillars to <laughs> just hang out. That's if they, uh -huh. it's you laugh, but that's the easiest it's, solution. It's worked found. for Peter Gallagher. Yeah. <laughs> well, this well, the funny Peter Gallagher. The funny thing is that he was he was trying a new skin treatment where you put glue on your face, and two caterpillars crawled on while he was sleeping with the, with the glue, and they just got stuck there. Yeah, yeah. He was sleeping under a uh, uh, a rose bush. <laughs> that was his mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, what a charming idea! <laughs> well, uh, it makes I think it, uh, we could, we should leave on that on that delightful note of uh, Peter Peter Gallagher <laughs> with uh, caterpillars it. on his eyes on his yeah. face. Um, uh, I'll come back next time, I guess, to explain Adam Warlock to everybody. Yeah, I do I do hope to do that. I can't wait to listen to this episode and find out what you guys were talking about with Tom Brokaw. I imagine it was mm -hmm. pretty straightforward and uh, <laughs> and made a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But for the flop house, I've been Elliot Kalin. I've been Dan McCoy. And I'm still Stuart Wellington. Bye. <laughs>